Thanks for stopping by. Tonight we have an interview with House of Freaks. But right now it's Guitar of the Week time. Guitar of the Week, a 1969 SG Junior. It's a flocked SG. I don't know if you can see this or not, but this thing is furry. And that is one of the original Maestrola tail, tail pieces there. It's a 69 because the shape of that pick guard is a little bit wider than the average SG. Nice P90 there that screams. And what we have here is a Gibson SG Junior. Guitar of the Week. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a show which is going to pay tribute to uh, a friend of mine that I had met here through cable. Um, we had a lot of good times together, not only here, but uh, out doing things. Um, the only thing bigger than Rick was his heart, which we're going to find out tonight uh, through conversations with his friends, people who knew him, acquaintances through cable. Um, so with that, let's, let's get started. Uh, well, this here is an ode to... Uh should we say, Rick Orris, uh, a.k.a. Rick Rock. You know, uh, there's, there's only a few things I can really say. The, the gentleman was just, uh, well, by the way, Rick, hi, how you doing up there? We know you're looking down going, what the hell are you gentlemen doing? Come on, gentlemen, hey, don't even use that word, Rick. I, I, I could hear you in the back, you know, back in my head somewhere, slapping me, that's it. Uh, being, a, being a member of the public access studio going, Rick, you were uh, very liked, very respected. Anything that you did here seemed to turn out just beautifully. Um, musically, professionally, you, you were... I uh, will always remember the individual, a.k.a. Rick Rock. One hell of a musician, one hell of a volunteer, one hell of a friend. Anything... I couldn't do you justice, Rick, by speaking about you. I'm, I'm going to try here, but I, I know that uh, wherever you are, you're looking at us, you're going, you enjoyed had a good time. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I can, if, if I got to reminisce on anything back with uh, Rick Orris, aka Rick Rock, uh, I can re recall when um, him and I, he and I, should I say, went to the Jenny Jones show as um, I wanted to say contestants, but I know that isn't right. Uh, we were on the show anyway. We, the topic was um, worst, and I hate to say it, worst public access show in America. And uh, I'll use the name Dave Tamez was the individual that Rick and I brought. Uh, I can recall um, the limo coming for myself, that is, to pick me up. And um, I'm looking in, in the limo. Where's Rick? Where's Rick? And I asked, you know, the limo driver, well, Rick, no, you're Rich. I'm like, no, my name's Rich. I mean, you're Rick. I'm like, no, I'm Rich. So we get to, the, we get to Jenny Jones, to the studio, looking all over for Rick, checking with the hotel uh, concierge. And he, he hasn't showed up yet. So he's giving me a call on my phone going, You're, where, where's the limo at? And I'm going, where are you at? He's going, I'm still in, uh, what was it, Griffith at the time. They're over on Broad Street. And um, it's like, no, the limo didn't pick me up. I'm like, I thought you were already with a different limo. Uh, anyway, back to, they finally sent another limo to pick up Rick. Uh, here he strolls in to the um, hotel out there in Chicago. Roughly, we're looking at like 9.30 p.m. Next, next day the show was at like, uh, God, taping was like at 7.30 a.m. Uh, so here he comes in. We, we go down to the bar, have a good drink. Uh, the only thing I'd say is being there, 
with Rick, I mean, it, it, something in my memory I'm never going to forget. Uh, he, again, he, he was one heck of a gentleman. If there was anything on his mind, he didn't hesitate to say it. There wasn't any BS. He was straight to the point. There was something that the gentleman was very respected about. Not only for his musical talents, but just being a genu genuine gentleman. To the point, we, there's, there's not many people out here, just personally speaking, that I can see that actually would just say it like it is. And, and actually step up to the plate. You know, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. Well, Rick, he, he did both. Maybe not always fast, but, you know, that's, that's just the way some of us are. Sometimes we're a little slower than others. You know what I mean, Rick? And uh, no matter what, we're always going to think of Rick um, in the best light. There's going to, I have not heard any bad words, and nor, and especially a vulgar SOB such as myself, I've never been able to speak a bad word about Rick. The only thing, I, another thing I can say is we're going to truly miss him here at the Public Access Studio here in Hammond. And I know there's quite a few organizations in the area that are going to miss Rick showing up and lending his musical talents, especially um, at um, volunteer picnics that we normally had. Um, we're just going to truly miss the gentleman no matter what. There's, there's just so much back in the memory I'm just swirling around. Um, him showing up here and there, doing little bits and pieces of, uh, uh, in, you know, lending his musical talents to other people's shows. He was very respected. He truly will be missed. And, you know, I, I don't know really much that could justify. No, you don't have to. I take the back. You don't have to justify Rick. He justified himself by just being, just by giving his talents, his time. You know, he had a very, very true commitment to the public access studio to reiterate again, and to uh, just his fellow friends and even associates out there, I may say. He was there for pretty much all of us. If there was anything we really needed his musical talents for or just him for some moral support to, to do a show, to be behind the scenes, anything, Rick was there. Uh, we, we didn't even have to ask twice. If he had the time, he showed for us. And I, I can remember going over to... Um, to his house in Dyer when he finally got it built. Uh, I remember the SLV had, and I hate to say it that way, but Rick, you know, you know we got to talk, talk honest. An eight person jacuzzi. Rick, I know you better have loved that thing, you know? Wherever you're at now, I know you got a bigger one. And I know you're enjoying yourself, whatever, because you had a, a very good life, and we'll always respect you for it, for everything that you've given back to. Um, I can say just for me, you, you were a good friend. You were definitely straightforward, honest, respectable. And if I put my foot in my mouth, which I usually did, you would not hesitate to tell me about it. And uh, I always respect you for that. Um, like I said again, at going over to your house in Dyer back there before, looking at your, your room full of guitars, I'm telling you, Rick. You were just, just one hell of a gentleman. No matter what, uh, that was a beautiful house. I'm, I'm glad you had the time to spend in it, that uh, you, enjoy, you enjoyed yourself. Um, I really don't know what to say anymore, um, except to say that no matter what, we're truly going to miss you. Miss you, not just your talents, but you. So wherever you're at, just remember, thank you very much for always being here for public access, for being here for your friends, and no matter what, we'll always remember you to the day we cease. And we hope that public access keeps going on, Keep showing your tapes. And anybody out there um, in the viewing public, if you have any tape, please don't hesitate to come by. See, I do believe if uh, the gentleman don't mind me using his name, Mr. Robert Schultz or Mr. Carlos Godinez, I think they'd love to have the footage. I know we would here. So anybody out there that uh, can hear us, see us, feel us, please don't hesitate to give a call. Just stop on in. Just drop off some footage. And just one last time, no matter what, Rick, wherever you're at, you enjoy yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't know Rick all that well, um, but I do know him from the Friday Night Club uh, show we did here at Cable Access in Hammond. And uh, he had a very corny sense of humor, and it was uh, very sort of childlike, uh, but it was, it was nice. It was refreshing, and he liked to make people laugh. He liked to laugh. He could take a joke, he liked to tell jokes, and he was a hell of a guitar player. 
a lot of people knew that he played in a bunch of different bands. And uh, he played on our show, and he would just call out a tune, or we would ask him to play something, and he would do it, no questions asked. Uh, he was really easy to work with and quite a delight, and we're all going to miss him. Uh, like I said, I'm not exactly sure where I should start, but the first thing everybody remembers about Rick is he was a musician and a damn good one. Um, I guess music had been a, a part of his life ever since he was a little kid growing up, and the different influences he had, you know, he especially loved the Beatles from Frank Zappa to the residents to mainstream stuff. Um, and he could play just about anything and feel comfortable doing it. Um, you know, he had told me he started in music when he was in school playing band. Um, he could play brass instruments from trombone, uh, trumpet, I'm not sure exactly what else. Um, but he really loved the guitar. You know, the guy could play a piano, um, drums, bass, you name it. You know, he was a one-man band, essentially. Um, one thing that impressed me about him, and maybe I'm easy to impress, but one night I went over to his house and he was uh, sitting there playing along to an album. You know, he had his guitar and uh, I just thought that was unique that you can, I mean, I'm sure there's a hundred musicians that can do it, but I, I was really surprised that you could just pick any song and just go to town, you know. Um, another thing about Rick is he, he loved comedy, and that's probably why we got along so well together. Um, he did, you know, many, many things here besides the Rick Rock show, which featured music and different musicians. Um, I mean, some of the different weird characters he used to play, like a, like a Ken Shabby type from Monty Python, or the uh, list goes on and on. It, it's, it, it's hard to pull some of my favorites from that. Um, and other than that, you know, he was generous with his time, you know, he would uh, appear with different groups for, for charity. He was doing some kind of symphony thing where he played guitar with this local symphony group. Um, he would show up in support of other musicians, opening up for them, things like that. Um, one fun thing, you know, when when I was in high school, I tinkered around playing bass, not all that good, but um, Rick sometimes would show me little things to do with a bass guitar, and me and him would drive up north to this place in Chicago and go to like an open mic night where he would uh, play, and he would have me come up and do a couple of simple songs with him. You know, sort of like something like American Woman. He's like, okay, now this is a one note. You know, just, just keep playing this one note. You know, and if you if you want to change up and play a note here, it'll be the same thing. Um, just simple, fun things like that. You know. Um, on a on a personal note, um, you know, it's it, it it's it's kind of sad to see someone around your own age you know, passing away kind of reminds you of your own mortality. And um, I, I once thought that if I had ever gotten married at some point, I was planning on having him be the musician and, you know, uh, have some of his friends be the band. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss him. Hi, I'm Bill Herbst. Um, and I first met Rick Rock, I believe it was the summer of 87 when um, we were doing a weekly show here on Channel 16, what was then actually Channel 25. And Rick was doing um, the Rick Rock show. And we had the 6.30 slot on Fridays and he was the 7 o'clock and we always saw him in here doing his stuff, uh, editing and shooting while we were doing the same and hit it off right away. And then we were kind of clumped together on Fridays, so we watched his show, and uh, he would mention uh, having seen parts of our show, and eventually we, we started talking about doing shows together, and we would actually 
uh, help out sometimes with uh, one time I remember shooting a band well actually I won't talk about that because it involved me getting into a bar underage and I would never want to imply that uh, Rick Rock would in any way support or condone any kind of illegal <coughs> activity but um yeah we would we would help out in each other's shows and then um, I would disappear for a couple years and I'd come back and it was always nice to see Rick and um, I'm sure like a lot of people probably will mention Rick's uh, Rick's love of music and his talent as a musician and his his considerable vinyl collection which um, as far as I, I I've seen a lot of people who had vinyl collections but nobody's collection of old 33's rivaled that of Rick Rock that I've ever seen. I mean that guy literally had wallpapered his house in vinyl. He loved music but and so a lot of people Rick Rock musician. To me Rick was always yes great musician and a lover of music but to me he was always like he, a total showman and, and um, a ham but like the good kind of ham and a very self-deprecating in his humor and we kind of had that in common. He was very egoless about it. It was always the show had to work, you know, what, how, whatever, whoever the joke was at the expense at, there was never any, any, any animosity about it, you know. Rick was a really good sport and, um, you know, always quick with a laugh. Uh, Rick was king of all cheesy jokes. If you've ever heard a cheesy joke that you've heard a million times, Rick told it first. That is Rick's joke. Um, for instance, Rick told me once, and this was probably, again, you know, close to 20 years ago, about the uh, pirate who walks into a bar and he's got a wheel sticking out of his fly, steering wheel. The bartender says, hey, you know, you got a steering wheel sticking out of your fly, and the uh, pirate says, "Ah, it's driving me nuts. So every time you've heard that joke, that's actually a Rick Rock original. That's, and there's, there's millions of, of others which I, won't, which I won't torture you with. Okay, one more. Um, Bear walks into a bar, says, give me, uh, he says, hey, I, I need a drink. Bartender says, sure, what'll it be? Uh, Bear says, um, make it a scotch and soda. Bartender says, why the big pause? That too was a Rick Rock joke. Um, so yeah, Rick was great for stuff like that. And he will be missed. I've always, you know, like I said, I've always kind of come and gone from this place and I'll disappear for a couple of years and then come back and everybody is here again. And you know, you, you run into the same people and it's like a part of your life comes back every couple of years, if you're like me anyway, and you just do it now and then. And it'll be weird not seeing Rick around um, the next time I come through. So Rick, wherever you are, rock on bro. Uh, my name is Karen Long. And you are I was Rick's girlfriend. <laughs> and and uh, I met him in um, 97. Mm -hmm. And uh, a mutual friend of ours introduced us to each other, and his name was Frank Livingston. And uh, are you actually in the mutual music scene? And have you heard of Rick before that? Um, not a lot. Not a lot. So it was like kind of a cold meeting when we met. So. Uh, boy, um, any funny moments you can tell us about in the, going to Rick? And, um, funny stories maybe? Oh, mm, well, every day was great. Every day was a different funny story that happened. And um, most of all, I think, um, we just enjoyed hanging out with our friends mostly and um, going out to hear other bands, going out on gigs. <laughs> yeah, he, he really supported the music, the local music scene. He was a local icon. Yes, he was. He yes, he was. So, uh, supported uh, a lot of upcoming musicians too. Gave him a lot of the first shots. Oh. Prominence. Uh, can you he sure on did. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, maybe? Um, well, um, oh, not really, <laughs> not really, but um, um, I know he was um, really interested in his own band um, the last year, uh, Glass Onion, and um, 
Dave and Scott came over all the time and they jammed and it was just a, it was a pleasure to be there to hear them try out their new songs and play the old ones too. That's right, I, under, I knew that you really was uh, in a vast catalog of musical knowledge. And well, I don't think there was a song that if you just hummed a few bars of it, Rick would know it. He would know who wrote it and who did it and everything else. He'd know everything about it. He was often referred to as the human jukebox. Yes, he was. <laughs> There's been times I mean, I've tried to quiz him and I couldn't stump him. It was just like, wow. Wow. Um, but um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> We're just sort of doing this list. Tom, you got anything? Anything other? Um, I'm a little brain with doing this part of the book. I, I honestly, I haven't, I've been making notes. I wasn't listening too much to what you were covering. Um, basically, uh, <coughs> well, I know Rick uh, enjoyed doing the radio program with Tom. Was yeah. that February? Uh, yes, it was, Tom. Okay, yes, it was. it was. Yeah. He enjoyed that so much. You have no idea. He really did. And he enjoyed performing, too, because he sang uh, I'm Your Captain, I believe. Right. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> what were Rick's, uh, major that was a favorite song of his. What were Rick's major musical influences as far as groups and stuff? Um, well, the Beatles. I would say the Beatles, probably. And then there were a lot of uh, groups, really. Budgie. And uh, Rick liked... Um, MC5. The MC5, yes, we had that in common, mm -hmm. and he couldn't believe that I knew who they were. <laughs> but it was good. And on his last CD, he did um, an MC5 song, and uh, I enjoyed that one a lot that he did. Uh, again, uh, he was such a local music icon. I mean, everywhere. Oh yeah. Everybody knew Everyone him. knew Rick. Everybody, everybody knew him. I mean, Everyone knew Rick. And uh, again, his uh, musical taste ran gamut from early '60s, late '50s, all up to present day. Yes. And, uh, like I said, with the Rick Rock Show, uh, you can you, were you actually ever the chance to be involved with that? Or? Uh, no, not very much. Really? No, but I've seen most of them. <laughs> Oh, he did. He did. He did. Like I said, it was just an amazing look at him. It just, the way he just played, he would just pull things out of the air and just, man, there they were. He was amazing. Definitely. I mean, he was an influence to so many, and still is, too. That's the thing. It's His legacy is going to live on for a long, long, long time. If there was. One thing, uh, I think I would say this. You want to leave your mark on the world somehow, you know, for others. Yes. What Rick's think to us, what we think it would be as far as his, his legacy. Legacy, so to speak. Thank you. Um, that he was a great musician. And he touched the hearts of everyone, I believe. And he was. Just spectacular. And um, he had a kindness about him that just, you just had to love Rick when you met him. He, his personality was just super. He was just one of the most generous, kind hearted, sweet people. Yes, he was. Proud. Yes, he was. And, uh, like I said, so generous with his talent and his time. I think he showed all of us how to be a better person, really.
where was Rick going with his music? I know he was very involved with wanting to get back into the studio and record. And I had talked to him about two years ago, and he said he finally wanted to get some of his own stuff that he had been toying around with in his head, but he never really laid it down. Uh, was there anything going on as far as ambitions to finally get some of his own music down now that he had access to the studio? Yes. Uh, he um, had quite a few original songs that he wanted to, uh, you know, put down. And um, that was next. That was next. Were any of them tracked at all? Um, the tracks not that... Black Dog not at Black Dog, no. Mm -hmm. Just personal tracks that he made himself. Like, he had a few four tracks because he had a four track machine, but... Some of them were just cassette tapes. Just rough ideas? Just, well, they were songs that he did and played often, you know, but not really professionally recorded. Maybe, maybe one day you can get some of his friends together over at Black Dog and record an album with his tunes. Oh, that would be great. That's a great idea, Tom. <laughs> I think you should use it in this chair. <laughs> yeah. I'm good at production. <laughs> Um, oh, Rick was the greatest. I loved him with all my heart. And I miss him dearly. Dave, you were playing with Rick for a number of years. In fact, I met you through Rick. Yes. Um, how did you first come to work with him? I know you were established with him in Glass Onion, but did your relationship go back further than that? Uh, actually, uh, Jim Hilligans and I, we uh, just got done playing in a band together, and we decided to start going to some jam nights, and... Rick was doing a showing up at a jam night in Gary called the Lamp Lounge, and he was playing with different people. And we knew that Rick had played a bunch of Beatles music, and Jim and I thought, boy, that'd be the best thing, you know, for us to hook up with him because Jim was such a Beatle fan also, and Jim influenced me growing up to be a Beatle fan. And uh, sure enough, we all got together and we just played for, geez, probably about an hour and a half together, and it worked out from the bat. It was great. Did Glass Onion form from that jam then? Or? Yes, exactly. We just decided, you know, Jim and Rick exchanged numbers. We all exchanged numbers, and we just started hooking up together. And then uh, we just decided, hey, you know, we might as well start a band. And, and Rick came up with the, the idea that in the song Glass Onion, there's so many different Beatle references to different songs, and we do so many Beatle songs that Glass Onion would be the name to have because it is such a good reference for the different Beatle music. I know from hosting jam nights with him, uh, Rick was a phenomenal stage leader. Uh, being in a band with him, as I mean, he would call out chords and notes and C's and A's, and he had so sure. many hand signals. As someone that played with him on a regular basis, what was he like to work with as a band leader? Uh, Rick was the easiest guy to follow because he he catered to you. If he knew that you didn't know the part well enough, he would make sure that he gave a big enough hand sign or a big enough gesture to know that this is where it stopped and this is where it started. And there would be so many times where Jim and I did. Uh, so many uh, club dimension gigs, and he'd say, "All right, we're gonna play this song," you know. And Jim and I look at each other, and you know, we're we're pretty well versed in music. And here's Rick, you know, he's well versed in music, you know, beyond our years and beyond a lot of people's years of music. And he'd say, "All right, we're gonna do this song," and he'd call it off. And Jim and I would look at each other and say, "All right, here we go," because we knew we'd been in that situation before. We played so many songs, and nobody, you know, Jim and I didn't know it all, but Rick would just call it out. And it would work out fantastically because Rick was a great band leader, like you said. Okay. What are some of the more memorable shows that you guys have done? Um, you know, I never really thought about that as far as most memorable. Um, for a while there, we were we were playing out so much in the early '90s, and and there was just you know it was just you know it got to be a friendship thing, and it also became a band thing and a working thing that. Uh, I never really sat down to say, you know, which one. They were to us. They were all. They were all great because we, every gig we had a good time at. So we never really sectioned off any of the other gig being more prestigious or more important because to us they were all just equally important. The last Sunday was really big, as you said, for a long time. You guys were playing constantly, and then for about two years you kind of disappeared off the club scene. And just recently, right before Rick's death, you were starting to pop up at Rodney's and different places. Was the band starting to get back into full swing again? Did Rick want to get back into it? And what happened that made it uh, drop out for a while? I think we all got different uh, 
venues going on, different people, you know, Jim started doing different things, I started doing different things, and Rick got involved with different things, but we all still stayed great friends, and then um, we just decided, you know, it was, you know, Glass Onion needed to, to live again, so we just started to start, start playing again, and Jim was busy with other projects, so we got Scott Merkel to take over on the bass, and uh, Scott and Rick go back a long way, so meeting Scott through Rick was just meeting like another, you know, just like me and Jim are, are brothers, me and Scott became brothers too because of Rick. Now, how long was Scott with the band? Scott was with the band for about two years, but he played with Rick many years before that, so. Did they grow up together? Is that, that yes, right? Scott and Rick grew up together, yes. Okay. Uh, obviously, Rick was a huge Beatles fan, and I know when I had him on the show, I made reference to the Glass Onion and Scott, he goes, oh yeah, they, they're pretty much a Beatles tribute. Rick stopped us right there and says, no, 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 we're not a tribute. Yeah. They, everything from A to Z. Yep, exactly. Uh, did it start out as a Beatle tribute and then morph into more things? I think we... We knew that we were Beatles fans at the at the jam night that we played for an hour and a half, but every song we played wasn't all Beatles songs because Jim was into so much different music and so was I and so obviously we Rick was too and we all decided, you know, a good song's a good song and you know, and if it if we like to rock it out or if you know if you know, we knew it was gonna be a good song, we just decided to do you know, not stop but just Beatles, just do every kind of thing that was influencing us and, and fun for us to play. Now, a lot of people that saw Rick in the clubs don't realize that he was very proficient at multiple instruments. When you guys would rehearse and he'd bring a new song in, an obscure Zappa or a Jethro Tull, would he say, okay, Dave, here, let me get behind the kit and show you how this song goes? Well, he, he, would, he knew how, once again, Rick being the band leader that he was, he knew how to use the language and the terminology where I could understand him so I wouldn't have to go, well, does it do this or does it do that? Rick would just lay it out and say, this is what it does. And, and he would make a little noise with his mouth or, you know, he would sing the part, like a drum part, and it's like, I understand completely what he's talking about because he was so, he knew exactly what he wanted and he knew how to get it across. Okay, getting back to the original music question, were you guys at any point working on originals with Rick, you and Jim? Uh, Jim and I, no, we never, because we were playing so much and everything like that, we just, it was kind of just one day a week we were practicing and then the other, maybe Friday and Saturday we were playing out, so we never really had a chance to sit down and learn Rick's originals, and you know, unfortunately, but we never really did that. Was there a, a talk at this point with Scott that maybe you guys would be heading into that direction? Um, you know, uh, Rick had talked about uh, doing different things, and uh, the original projects weren't really mentioned too much, but he had always talked about it before. But, you know, just recently he wanted to get the, you know, start playing out a little bit more and do a little more of that, but he never really wanted to, never said specifically, let's work on these originals and, you know, but he always talked about it, but we never laid down a date or anything like that to start working on him. Now, you were on the recording, his last recording, the yes. Black Dog, which was taped in March, I believe. Uh, March and February, yeah. Uh, now, he played all the instruments except the drums, which you did. What yes. was it like to work with Rick in the studio? It was a different environment for you, having been on stage and in jam nights for so long, to actually work behind the scenes in a studio. Uh, playing with Rick in the studio was just being on stage with him, because I, he would lay down a rhythm track and... Uh, I would uh, I would have no problem following Rick and laying it down because Rick directed us just like he would on stage. You know he he uh, you know he he looked at me with the big endings and where things had us break and stop. And most of the songs Rick and I had played together for a lot of years, so you know it was second nature to us anyway. Obviously, you had the Beatles in common and a few other things. Rick turned me on to so many different bands, bands I'd never even heard of. Was there any bands that he? influenced you into listening to or liking that maybe have impacted you as a musician? Oh sure, uh, Captain Beyond is a big one. Uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, and then Rick would talk about Captain Beyond and talk about all the different bands that Captain Beyond belonged to and he'd start rattling off and it's like, wow, I like that band, but that guy was from this band and Rick knew all, where all these guys came from, where they all went to, and it's just, you know, just influenced me the fact that, you know, there were so many other great musicians who played in obscure bands that nobody knew about, and and uh, Rick knew them all, and he just you know, Captain Beyond's a big one that, that I can that I can say. And Zappa, I was never really into Zappa because my generation, I'm I'm 35, and by that time in the mid 70s, you know, we were we were turned on and influenced by what MTV put out, and MTV didn't put Frank Zappa on, MTV didn't put Captain Beyond on, so Rick did influence me a lot in a lot of great music that basically got forgotten. What's a side of Rick that wasn't necessarily seen by the public that you as a close friend uh, can share with us at this point? Um, let's see. 
Rick was, Rick would never, you know, what I noticed, what I, when I noticed that people would, you know, Rick, Rick would always be the constant performer and he would never let anything or any situation on stage, you know, slow him down. He'd always be the constant performer and, and, and the thing that I think a lot of people didn't realize is that the way Rick was on stage was the way he was in life too. It wasn't an act. It was the way he was. Any special memories, uh, private memories, besides the ones on stage that, uh, that you'd like to share with anybody? You know, there's just too many to, you know, little ones, individual ones to pinpoint it. Okay. And one other thing, and Rick was a big Beatle uh, convention. Oh, yeah. He would go all the time. I know Jimmy went. Did you go to those? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, went up to Rick's room, and Rick had everything decked out. had everything Beatle music playing in the room. He had all kinds of kinds of different things that he had been doing for years and years that staples as far as his time at the convention and and uh, Rick, Rick enjoyed those conventions to no end he just enjoyed them and enjoyed them and looked forward to it every year as soon as the as soon as the the show was over he had his room booked for the next year already so <laughs> yeah what is something that uh, really made Rick Rock happy what what was it that really gave him a, a, a and made him happy in life? Performing. I'd say performing uh, because he took so much time to learn all he learned and, and to be able to show it and know that, you know, that people would know that he, he could do it and have a good time with it. That was, I, I believe that, you know, Rick liked that a lot. Okay, and one last thing. What's the biggest lesson learned, the biggest uh, thing that you will take with you the rest of your life that you might not have had you not met Rick Rock? Be happy always. I'm Jeff Beatty. I'm just a real good friend of Rick's. Known him for a long time, most of my entire life. Jeff, how did you uh, come to meet Rick? He and I both played trombone in junior high school. Uh, be Mr. Brown's concert band at Wilbur Wright Middle School in Munster. So you've been uh, together ever since? Pretty much. Did you work with him musically in his career? I would be behind the scenes, but yeah, um, always. In what capacity? Helping set up shows, roadie, set up gear? We had a number of interesting terms for my job, but in some respects, um, just someone to be there and help. Sometimes I'd carry a guitar or an amp, sometimes I didn't have to do anything other than ride shotgun. Um, someone to talk to after a gig was done. He'd download the gig, we'd talk about it, whether it was good or bad, uh, break, break it down into the individual songs. Sure. So you were kind of like a sounding board for him? Yeah. Oh yeah, all the time. Okay. And towards the end with the last few gigs, um, he, he simply wouldn't play out without me. E even if I did nothing, he just wanted me there. What, uh, what was Rick like off stage? Uh, again, as I talked with Dave, a lot of people know Rick from being in the jam night scene and things like that, but the, Rick the person, the behind the scenes Rick, what was he like? Really private. Um, he would give so much of himself on stage. I know it always felt good to just get in the car or get home and shut the world out. And um, I probably, uh, I would guess that probably some of his best times were spent by himself, where he didn't have to be on stage, didn't have to deal with someone being a fan. Um, maybe alone by himself in the bathtub, or alone by himself watching the TV. Um, a little bit of serenity and tranquility uh, was something he really appreciated. And I don't think people would realize that just from, from knowing him from the onstage Rick, where he's always jamming and always giving of himself. Um, it's taxing, it really is. And I don't think people realize the amount of effort or the amount of hours or the amount of work he put into performing. Uh, towards the end, it, it was physically painful for him to go out and do a gig. Uh, last few gigs, one of the Rodneys we just plain called it early. There wasn't anybody there. He wasn't feeling well. Um, he complained to me, geez, Jeff, if there's any way I could get out of this gig. Uh, 
Dave was at the gig, I passed word on to him, he talked to the bar owner, and next thing you know, we were getting out of there. But he was that dedicated, even, even to the point of pushing himself to the, the, the point of pain. And consummate professional that he was, he didn't let it show too much on stage. He was always, as he told me, because there was plenty of times he didn't want to gig, uh, absolutely did not want to gig, uh, thanked me profusely for helping him get prepped, and he said, just get me, get my butt on stage, put the guitar in my hands, plug me in, and it will be fine. And it was. Uh, we'd literally drag him kicking and screaming, complaining, right up into the time he sat down, strapped on, plugged in. He was in his element then, and he would do great. Where was his head at the time of his death musically? Again, we were talking with Dave that it seemed like he wanted to get Glass Onion going again. I mean, and he was recording again in the last couple of months of his life. Where was he at musically in his head? Getting back to where he was. He was still just sort of recapitulating. Um, I'd be real familiar with all his original compositions, and I know he didn't write anything new after 1980. Two pieces he wrote after 1980 would be the beginning and ending themes of the Rick Rock show, but all of his original work would date before 1980. And uh, I probably have numerous copies, some of them back from the late 70s and some of them from his four-track years. We did some four-track in the 90s. And um, with access to Black Dog, you might have seen those put down again. Um, I, I was really fond of his original tunes. Is there a reason he stopped writing after 1980? Sure. And it might be what? <laughs> um, <clears throat> be his senior year in high school. His mom would have passed away summer just prior to. And his main musical cohort at the time would have been Dave Krauss, keyboard player Dave Krauss. And right around 1980 is when Krauss, his family moved to Nashville. And so Rick lost his main musical ally and never really established that sort of connection with anybody else after that. And I think he learned, I think those were very formative years for him <clears throat> because Rick tended to be more of a solo star after he graduated from high school. Most of what people would be familiar with is the solo Rick Rock and they don't necessarily align him with any one person in particular. Um, back in high school, it was him and Krauss, and they were uh, a twosome. And it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to establish that connection because him and Krauss goes back, they go back to the junior high school years, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and it would be difficult to find somebody as an adult that you can establish those sort of types of connections with and then Rick preferred to be the star. He liked to be the man leading the band. Um, he was just naturally good at it. Uh, we referred to that role as being concert master. Uh, as much as he was the, sometimes the conductor, you know, the conductor gets to stand out in front. Rick had to play an instrument. He would be the concert master. And he would call the tunes and spell out the chords, and anyone else could follow along easy enough. What was it about jam nights? He was the king of jam nights. He played jam nights in every club, I think, that's in the region. Yes. At one point, or at other. one point, he was Mr. Jam Night. He would be out there every night of the week. If there was a jam night in this area, he was there. What was it about jam nights that fascinated him so much? Did he just like to interact with so many different talents? Here again, he's out there as a soloist looking for a band, looking for a musical ally, looking for people to hook up with. Um, this is probably part of the reason he was in so many bands throughout the 80s. He's, he was looking for, for a something. I don't know that he ever really found it. Um, and Jam Nights was a way to connect. It was a way to network. And, I mean, if you're going to be professional, why are you sitting home on a weeknight? Just because it's not a paying gig, that's no excuse to sit at home. He was going to make it. He was going to be discovered. He was going to be known. He was going to find others. And... Um, I certainly remember being at his first and second jam nights that he ever ever got out, and he was somewhat reluctant at first. Um, it takes a certain amount of courage to go up there by yourself or go out there without really knowing anyone and just kind of letting your uh, guitar and your music do the talking. 
And after, after a couple of years of this, um, this would go back, say, the first regular jam night would have been like Danny's in 1984. And after doing Danny's in 84, all other jam nights after that probably came pretty easy for him. He, he knew the drill. Uh, he knew a number of people. And I, I, I think that was just a way to get out there and participate, even though it wasn't necessarily a paying gig. Um, you know, you're not going to necessarily get paying gigs on weeknights. And so it's just a good way to go out there and meet others, tighten up. Um, and you never can tell who you might run into. That's kind of how he met the Glass Onions. Uh, probably how he fell into a, a, a lot of the bands he fell into. And I'm sure there's a zillion people out there today who can say, oh yeah, I jammed with Rick on a jam night, such and such and somewhere. Oh yeah, I, I know. <laughs> there's a zillion of them. What is your favorite memory of Rick at a personal level? There's too many. Just talking to him. Talking to him, talking shop, probably like after a gig, getting done with a gig. Uh, sometimes accidents happen and you have a really good gig. Nothing goes wrong. Um, yeah, the, I'll miss those times. Okay. And what is the one thing that you will carry with you the rest of your life that Rick Rock is still doing? Too many things to list. Um, One thing, I suppose if I had to put it into a sentence, Rick would remind me every now and then that I am great. In my own way, compared to what, who knows, but just me being me, I am great. And as great as he himself was, he wasn't afraid to let other people know how great they were too. And so yeah, that's probably the one thing that I'll carry, carry away most with me. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to? Oh hey, I got Nasty Ringo with me. Show it. <laughs> All right, you can't really see this too well. I just walk up to the camera. Oh, we got a cameraman. Nasty Ringo. What's the story behind Nasty Ringo? Wow, Nasty Ringo, he would be at the Beatle Fest Rick Rock shows. Uh, Rick did the Rick Rock TV show. It would be sort of like Jam Night. You're not getting paid, but at least you got a stage, so take advantage of it. And what happens on the Beatle Fest shows is, oh yeah. Get a good shot of Nasty Ringo. Nasty Ringo. He is so pissed. And if you were one of his friends that went with him to a Beetlefest show, you wound up being on the Rick Rock show. And one of the things in the hotel rooms with all his friends where they'd be hanging out was a picture on the wall, a pencil sketch of Nasty Ringo. And this is a Nasty Ringo t-shirt. Nasty Ringo began life as nothing more than a pencil sketch on the wall. Then a subsequent year, someone got the idea of taking the Nasty Ringo sketch and Xeroxing it and shrinking it and putting it into a little plastic like backstage pass thing. So people could walk around, people in the Rick click could have their little Nasty Ringo backstage pass placard hanging from their neck. And there were some extras made, and they got handed out amongst the Beatle Fest. Next, you know, there's all kinds of people wearing their nasty Ringo placard. A later year comes by, someone's actually selling nasty Ringo t-shirts. <laughs> no royalty or whatever paid to the original artist. No connection made with the Rick Rock or Rick Friends or people that actually did it. But yeah. I guarantee there's Rick Rock shows from Beetle Fest where he pans around the room, says hello to all the friends, and then pans up to the picture on the wall, and Nasty Ringo is here. Oh, he is just so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and it just seems sort of cute and ironic that he should wind up on a t-shirt somehow, somewhere. Uh, somebody else has gleaned profit from Nasty Ringo. I guess that's the, the American way, don't you know? <laughs> 
But it seemed fitting if I'm going to do a tribute to Rick Rock and a Rick Rock show. Hardcore Rick Rock show fans wouldn't recognize Nasty Ringo. Is there one song, in, in closing, is there one song um, that makes you think of Rick more than any other? That Budgie album. Never turn, your back, never turn your back on a friend. Yeah, I happened to put that on since his passing. Um, it's almost painful to listen to. It sounds so much like him. I, I, I can hear the influence. Um, and that's something, he's been listening to that stuff since high school. And uh, as much as the Beatles or, or any other mainstream well-known group, Budgie was a serious influence on him. Uh, and, and if you listen to that album, gee, it just sounds so much like Rick. It's, it's kind of scary. Um, you've probably had that album or songs from it on your radio show, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's probably a Rick pick if there ever was one. Yeah. And I mean, gee, if I had to pick, uh, back in the day, Rick used to have album of the week and guitar of the week. And so I challenged myself, what would be one album that makes me think of Rick? And I, I suppose it's that one, the budgie, never turn your back on a friend. Uh, some, some really great tunes, uh, just a really great album altogether from a really great band that few people are really aware of. Um, and I also think it's a shame, besides most people never got to hear Rick play his original stuff, um, Rick didn't play some of the tunes he would have liked to have played out, Budgie being one of them, uh, a version of Bread Fan Live would have been really great. I, I certainly didn't see it too much. <laughs> and man, I got to a lot of them that nobody saw. I would be like the only person in the crowd. <laughs> uh, because when he'd have a solo, solo gig, um, I would be the only person he'd call. And we'd go do the gig together. And he'd get up and jam for like four hours constantly, four hours nonstop. And, and just pack it up, go home. And some of those were the greatest gigs the greatest gigs were the ones nobody ever saw, I think. One thing that I remember, when Donatello's was open, and Rick and I were doing a lot of shows together, uh, the owner of Donatello's gave Rick the Rick Rock chair, the rocking chair. Whatever happened to that rocking chair? We do not know. Honestly. I thought that was a classy thing. It's like Rick came I, I was hoping to take possession of the Rick Rocker, but I don't know where it is. It did exist up until a couple of years ago. We suspect it went out to play somewhere on stage, because he'd use it on stage. Um, and it must have gone out to a gig and never made it back for whatever reason. It got so badly damaged it wasn't worth salvaging. Um, that's the best I can, I can imagine, because I know we weren't using it at the end. Okay. And, I, and I haven't I seen it since. To ask you, what happened to the rocking chair? It was an exquisite piece of work and a really, a really nice gesture from uh, the people at Donatello's. I think I have some pictures somewhere of it, but where I don't know. Sure, he would have used that at the Says Who gigs at Donatello's basement. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those were some really great gigs. Uh, the Says Who band was truly unique, I think, just with uh, the size and the horns and the, the level of detail of to musical arrangement that Mark Jankosik would have put into that. He, he had parts written down in manuscript for everyone. and. Uh, that in itself just takes so much work. Okay. Uh, I also brought a guitar of the week. If anyone cares, I can show it off. Like this, or you want to put it on the stand? How does it look good? I can hold it. I didn't bring a strap so you wouldn't ask me to stand up. <laughs> see how that works? Let's see. Oh, this is presentable. Okay. Now, people are probably thinking this is an SG, but no, this is a four stringer. This is an EBO from the late 60s. And like I say, it looks just like an SG, 
but it's a bass. Gibson's not known for making basses, but this is one of them. The reason I happen to have this is I told Rick, gee, I need to learn how to play bass. All I gotta do is lay my hands on one. You don't happen to have one laying around that I could borrow, do you? And sure enough, he did. And so in the fall of 95 is when I got this particular piece. And Shucks, as much as he tried to get me to return it, you know, I, I just couldn't seem to lay my, I just forget to bring it over or whatever. And um, yeah, I fell in love with it the first time I laid eyes on it. And he thought, oh yeah, Jeff, well, this would be a great piece for you just to learn. It's a short scale neck. Uh, the action, really not bad for a beginner. It'll be perfect. And this sucker even has the original flat wound strings from back in the day. And uh, you go buy a bass guitar these days, you're gonna find round round strings. Um, and even though it's sort of a collectible, you'll notice imperfections. The head and stock name is not quite there. The pickups look to be modified. The switch is an add-on. The, the bridge is an add-on. But it's not what it's worth on the collector's market. It's what it's worth to me sentimentally. And so as sort of a tribute guitar of the week for the Rick Rock Show, I present the 67 EBO. I'm Tom Lounges, and uh, with Rick Rock, I like to think of him as being infinite. Uh, there is no beginning, no end with Rick. I can't remember the actual night I met Rick, but I can't remember a time when I didn't have him as a friend. Uh, I used him many, many times as a source with my articles in the Times and in my articles in the Beat. And even when I was doing stuff for Sony Records, I was doing liner notes for CBS Records, special products, and I would do albums by Johnny Winter and Johnny Tillotson and the Dixie Cups and the Shirelles, on and on and on. And uh, if there was a glitch in my notes and there was like something just missing there, I'd call Rick Rock because the odds are Rick would have that little missing nugget that I would need. Uh, Rick was one of my sources along with Dick Biondi and a few others, and I, I hold Rick in, in the same level of esteem as a Dick Biondi. Uh, he was a wealth of talent. Uh, so as a writer, he was, uh, he was an invaluable resource. As a friend, he taught me so much. A lot of people say, oh, you know so much about music. I learned a lot of what I know from Rick Rock. Uh, he was not only a human jukebox, he was a human uh, trivia game. I mean, we would actually stump each other sometimes. And I'll, although there were some times when Rick would call me and I had to help him on, I'm, I'm proud to say. There was a few nuggets here and there. But uh, it's the hardest thing since his passing is I get stuck on something. And my first instinct grabs a cell phone and call Rick. And I've done that with my wife a few times. I'd say, Julie, I gotta call Rick. Or we'll be in the studio on Night Rock and we'll be talking about a certain song. And we go to commercial. And I was like, boy, I need to say something about this artist. And I'll automatically go to call Rick because I always did that. And he's not there now. So it's those times that I miss him the most, I think, because he was always there. He was, he was that benchmark. And uh, it's, it's hard to, to adjust with him. There's that void there now. And, uh, you know, that's on the business sense, but also on the professional sense. And I wore my Grand Funk shirt for Rick tonight because uh, every time we did a beat party or we did a function in a club, Rick would always do I'm Your Captain, Closer to Home from Grand Funk. We share that in common. Um, I did a lot of work with Mark Farner from Grand Funk years ago. And uh, Rick was a big GFR fan. And so we talked a lot about Grand Funk. Uh, Rick turned me on to Frank Zappa. I'm a huge Zappa fan, and I probably wouldn't be had it not been for Rick. I, was, I dabbled in Zappa as, as a youth. And uh, when I'd go over to Rick's, he'd have like 200 motels playing. You know, and, and uh, he'd say, have you heard this one? Or have you heard that one? And he was a who's who of who played with Zappa. I mean, the, the wealth of talent from George Duke to Jean-Luc Ponte and uh, Basios and, and all those guys uh, that played with him. I mean, he would know the lineups on every album. Oh, this guy played on this. This guy's doing the vocals here. I mean, how he would know these things and keep it all in one head, I don't understand. The other thing about Rick is uh, he was a big man but he needed to be to hold the big heart that he had. I worked with him. It wasn't even work. I came and said I played with him uh, because it was more of a playground situation when we hosted uh, Jam Night at Club Dimensions in the late 1980s. 
and we spent about two years co-hosting Jam Night. Rick, of course, was the on-stage talent. I'd be the guy with the list coordinating it and DJing back and forth. And uh, one of the things about Rick, and uh, getting back to the hard aspect, is he would bring up a lot of kids that maybe had never played in public before. It was their first time. And he was like a mentor, like an instructor to them. I remember him going uh, in, the, in the office in the backstage area at, at Club Dimensions before they got on. And he'd sit there and say, okay, it's, it's a G, it's an A, it's a D, it's, then you go to this, you do that. If you get lost, watch me. I'll signal you. He, as Dave Deering had said and some of the other guys have said, um, he was a great band leader. You could follow his lead. He was amazing. You, you could be lost up there. I mean, and I got up and sang with Rick a few times, and I would be lost. I'd, I'd forget a verse, and he would just come right in, and he'd start the verse, and then he'd like nod at you, and you'd start singing harmonies, and then he'd back off, and he'd get you back where you needed to be. So, and he always did it in such a smooth way that the public didn't know you really screwed up. You know? So he saved, he saved face for a lot of people. And uh, there's probably a lot of guys on the, on the club scene now that uh, have amazing stories to share with, about Rick. Uh, similar to that, where they may have been on stage the first time with him. He was the king of jam nights. I worked with him, as I said, at Club Dimensions extensively, but he played everywhere from Mickey's to... Uh, actually, I think I, I think I might have met him at the hideout uh, or, the, uh, or Danny's. We had some phase there when it was turning from the hideout to Danny's because that's when I really started going into the clubs a lot, and he was one of the first people I ever met as far as being a musician on stage. And uh, I, I had the honor of working with him on the Rick Rock Show, the infamous Rick Rock Show that aired here in Cable. Uh, in 1988, I was a uh, publicist of Superfest in Lansing. We did Ario Speedwagon, Bellamy Brothers, Waylon Jennings, and all these different people in Lansing. And uh, Rick and I got really close that year. Uh, he was doing the show, and all this stuff was going on. For some reason, we kept bumping into each other all the time. And I brought the Buckinghams over. Our company was managing the Buckinghams at the time, and they were playing all these fests for us. So I brought the Buckinghams down here to the, to the cable studio, and that was a big thrill for Rick, because he was really into the 60s. He you know, was good friends with Flo and Eddie from the Turtles, and he, he knew them, and he knew some of the Beatle Fest guys, and Pete Best, and all these other people. And the Buckinghams were like Chicago's answer to the Beatles. I mean, they took their name because... Uh, a guy at WGN actually gave him their name uh, right before a television show because he said it sounded British. So that's how they became the Buckinghams. But we had Carl Giamarisi um, down here and uh, Nick Fortuna, the bass player. And uh, it was great because Rick was just in his element. I mean, he was talking the 60s. And he was a young man at that point. I mean, he really, we had lived in the 60s, but we were little kids. I mean, I was, I'm older than Rick was, and, uh, and I, I barely remember certain parts of those, of those days. But uh, Rick was right in his element. He went on one talking about hullabaloo, talking about the Ed Sullivan appearances, this and that. I mean, he really researched and knew his characters and his guests. And uh, that was one of the first times that I, I got to work with, uh, with Rick on the show. I, later on, when Enough's Enough out of Chicago broke big with their first couple of albums, I was working closely with them. And I brought uh, Chibs Enough down here and Derek Frigo, the guitar player. And we had a blast. We just had an absolute blast doing that show. And again, Rick was right in his elements. He talked guitars with Derek. I mean, they talked so much technical stuff on and off air. Uh, Chip, you know, he would ask him all the, you know, the, the typical interview questions, and he'd ask him some in-depth personal stuff. Rick did deep questions, but he also didn't get so deep that the non-musicians watching his show would get lost. So he'd come back and ask simple questions as well. And I, I'll never forget another situation. We had Spirit, the band Spirit that did I Got a Line on You at Woodmar Records and at Club Dimensions when I was there. And uh, we had him do an in-store at Woodmar, and Rick came down with his little portable camera, and he filmed them doing a meet-and-greet. And he interviewed Randy California and Ed Cassidy there. And I, you, know, you always hear the, the typical interview things. And he actually asked him, what's your favorite color? And that floored me. I'm like, wow, somebody actually asked it. Because that's always like a running joke in the industry. When you do an interview, oh, what's your favorite color? And Rick asked him. He's like, you know, he goes, I got to keep the teen magazine uh, you know, vibe alive. He goes, because that's something they used to always ask in the 60s. And that's where that whole thing originated. So he still actually asked them that. And they got a kick out of it. It was such an inane question that they loved it. And it made them remember Rick. Because when he came over to Club Dimensions that night, he was hanging out with Randy and, and Ed Cassidy and these guys. And they were like, hey, yeah, my favorite color. You know, I changed it. I'm wearing pink underwear today. You know, that kind of It became a running joke. Um, and then he would also ask them the immortal 1960s questions, who influenced you more, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? He would ask that of a lot of his guests. 
And it's just, you know, working with celebrities never intimidated or, or starstruck Rick. He was one of them. He was on the same level. He wasn't as well known, perhaps, in, in the grand scheme of things, but musically and note for note, he was on an equal ground. But uh, those were good memories, and I'll, I'll never forget the Enough's Enough show we taped. My daughter Sarah came with me. She was little at the time. And uh, we were taping something or other, and she was playing with his rubber chicken. He had a rubber chicken here in the studio, and it was always hanging on a rope. And she was playing with the rubber chicken. And it was annoying me, you know, as the father, you know, I was like, quit playing with that. We're on a TV show. And Rick was just having a ball with it. He was like fueling the fire, you know, Sarah, go play with this. And uh, he'd have her at the piano, and they were playing. And at the end of the show, I grabbed the chicken, and I shoved my finger in the chicken's mouth. I'm going, like, kill the damn chicken, you know. And uh, he had the cameras running. And he used that as the closing bit over the credits. Me choking the chicken. Literally. And uh, I'll never forget watching it on TV. I was living in Hammond at the time, so I was watching it. And uh, it, I'm sitting in my living room eating pizza. I almost choked. It's like, I call him like, Rick, I can't believe he did that. He goes, hey, it was natural. It was, it was a great piece of footage. So it, it, a lot of fun. He was a prankster. He did a lot of fun stuff like that. A lot of fun stuff. Uh, and again, uh, getting back to some of the artists, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I do night rock, which we play really deep cuts and obscure artists and things. And a lot of the artists that we play, we owe to Rick. For one, he turned me on to them years ago. I would never have listened to the Sensational Alex Harvey Band and Bambo and the Tomahawk Kid and the Man in the Jar. Uh, these are all things we play on the show because Rick turned me on to that band and Captain Beyond and Budgie and a lot of the Zappa, as I said earlier, a lot of Frank Zappa stuff. We do a Zappa Cut of the Week, which we kind of do inspired by Rick because he made it, me realize how important Frank Zappa was in the grand scheme of things. So uh, a lot of the music we play on Night Rock, we owe to the spirit of Rick Rock. And we also owe it to the physical Rick Rock because when we started the show almost two years ago, my collection was all vinyl. I don't have a lot of CDs of the old school variety. I've got all the new demos and promos of all the new bands. But uh, for this type of show, I had to call in a favor, and that favor was with Rick. And we went over to his house and uh, started pillaging his rooms full of music and made, you know, I was going to go over for an hour or two. And my wife's like, oh, that ain't going to happen. So eight hours later, we're still looking for CDs and playing this and playing that. But Night Rock got its start a couple years ago, and about 50% of our library for the radio show came from Rick Rock's personal collection. He just w went crazy burning CDs for me. And uh, the one day we were over there, he wasn't feeling all that good. But, you know, Rick was never one to say no. He, we needed to get the show on. He knew we needed some new music. We were limited. So it's like, come on over. So he sat in his chair with his remote, and he's because I didn't know how to burn CDs. So he's, he's uh, zapping the, the burner over there. And I'd say, hey, do you got this? Hey, do you got that? Remember that band? Remember this band? And he would direct me. Rick's house was like a museum for music. I mean, he had, I don't know how to describe it. CDs, box sets, film things, posters, guitars, amps. I mean, everywhere in Rick's house, there was music. There wasn't a room in the house where it didn't reek of music. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, you know, I've got the Moody Blues or whatever you're looking for. He goes, Go through the hallway, down the right, go into the bathroom, next to the jacuzzi, there's three stacks on the sink, um, third stack, fourth CD up is going to be the Moody Blues. I'm like, how do you know this? <laughs> because there's piles of CDs everywhere. But it was just, his mind was amazing. His mind was, and not only did he know all the stuff about music and who played with who and the family tree of bands, but he had an outrageous collection with put most record stores to shame. And he knew where every title was. And it wasn't in a alphabetical, librarian-type system. It wasn't a Dewey Decibel system. He had piles here, piles there, piles on the floor, piles. But he knew exactly where every CD was and could pull them like that. And that just amazed me. Because I'm a major pack rat. And Rick was a pack rat when it came to music stuff. But I don't know where any of my stuff is at. I know It's in a box somewhere in that room. Rick knew exactly where they were. So uh, if you guys like Night Rock and you're, you're checking it out on Sunday nights, uh, every time we play something, at least every show, there's at least one or two cuts that Rick donated to the show up to our library. So that show always will be alive because of him. Or, and he will always be alive because of that show. So. You also mentioned how we give you daughter guitar lessons. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Rick, uh, aside from the, um, 
the business professional relationship we had in music and the clubs and the radio station and the TV show and things, Rick became a very dear friend. As a matter of fact, he was one of my best friends. Uh, I, can, I can say that with a clear heart and a clear conscience. I don't have a lot of friends because I'm in the music business. We know a lot of people. We have a lot of associates. We have a lot of mutual, you know. But the word friend is something I don't use a lot. And, and Rick was definitely a friend. And he showed it time and again. He would come over. I didn't have the money. Uh, my daughter was really interested in music. Didn't really have a lot of money uh, trying to make ends meet. He came over and taught my daughter Sarah every Tuesday. Would come to my office after school and teach her to play. Um, one of the biggest thrills, she's still playing to this day, you know, and actually she's gotten good. She gave up for a little bit and then she got back into it, but uh, she's playing acoustic now. But Rick taught her electric and one of the things that I was proudest of is she got up and sang happy birthday to Rick at J.J. Kelly's. Uh, made arrangements with the club owner to let her come in. She was like 16, 17. We kept her outside, brought her up just to do the happy birthday. She played happy birthday on guitar and uh, that meant a lot to Rick. Here's his student that he's been pushing and pulling and shoving to, you know, appreciate the instrument for what it is, not just, you know, because she wanted to be a pop singer. Um, but he, he put a lot of time into nurturing her. And another highlight on a personal level was uh, my son's birthday. We rented out the Lincoln Center in Highland. And uh, Rick, you know, we, we, you were there. And... Uh, we were at the Lincoln Center, and Rick walked in. He, he goes, well, what's going on? You know, it's, oh, you know, he's really into Dr. Seuss. He was like four years old, my son Dylan. And Rick walks in, <laughs> dressed as the cat in the hat. <laughs> the stovetop hat, the tie, the bit, the whiskers, the whole nine yards. Rick walks into this birthday party. Dylan didn't know Rick at the time. He, he was really little, didn't really remember Rick. He knew my, my daughter more than, her, than Dylan. But uh, he walked in, he was the hit. He was the cat in the hat. And my son didn't even realize that was Rick Rock until like just a few years ago. He'd always say, well, the cat in the hat came to my birthday party. The cat in the hat came to my birthday party. And uh, Rick, was, Rick was good for those kind of things. He was a very giving man, a very sweet man, a very humbling person to be around. Because you'd, uh, you know, you'd, you'd get angry, you'd get this and that. And then Rick was always that calming factor. He'd always like be the, the rational mind, I guess you'd call it, uh, the calming factor. Uh, and say, you know, what are you getting upset about? Who cares? You know, and then, then he'd tell a joke or he'd do a stupid story or he'd tell a useless piece of knowledge or something and, you know, get you off the, t off the bad subject and then make you laugh again. So Rick, uh, Rick gave a lot. He gave a lot. Uh, more than you can actually put in words. I mean, on a professional level, on a personal level, on a musical level, on a humanitarian level. I mean, he was an amazing, an amazing person. I don't want to miss him very much. Okay, that's all the time we have left for on the show. I want to thank you for stopping by.